89.5. WEVF Colebrook 90.3. And WEVQ Littleton 91.9. And online at nhpr.org. From New Hampshire Public Radio, I'm Laura Canoy, and this is The Exchange. Today, an exchange listener favorite, our annual summer book show. We'll hear about the latest in fiction, nonfiction, history, mystery, and much more. And as always, all the books mentioned this hour by our guests and by you will be on our website later today. So you can go to nhpr.org slash exchange. Right now, though, tell us what you're hoping to read this summer or what you're still looking for in that perfect summer book. Send us an email. It's exchange at nhpr.org. Post your thoughts on Facebook or give us a call, 1-800-892-6477. And we are also on Facebook Live today, so you can listen and watch our show there. Our guests are Dan Chartrand. He's owner of Water Street Bookstore in Exeter. Dan, it's great to see you. Welcome back. It's great to be here, Laura. Also with us, Michael Herman, owner of Gibson's Bookstore in Concord. Michael, good to see you too. Thank you. Morning. And also with us, Liz Cipriano. She's general manager of Bookery Manchester. And Liz, a big welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Dan, I want to start with you, but hear from everybody. Just overall, when people come into your store, you know, it's after Memorial Day, summer's kicking off. Although the weather has yet to make it uh, definitive. No, it's, it's, it's summertime. It's summertime. <laughs> so they come in and they say, hey, Dan, you know, I really want that summer book. What do they mean? What are they after? Well, first of all, we ask them the question, are you a fiction reader or a nonfiction reader? Because, you know, like people tend to sort in those two categories, although there's a lot of people that read both. And then once we get zeroed in um, on what type of book they like to read, we have all of our staff picks displayed very prominently at the front of the store, as well as uh, independent bookstore picks from across the independent book channel in the country. We're very good at kind of cross-fertilizing our picks. So we've got all these books that are recent releases and longtime classics and maybe just more recent classics that we can recommend to these folks, and they're all written up by our staff. So it these bookstores of ours are very highly curated, and we can zero on on just exactly what someone wants to read for the summer. Um, and then they, they discover that that bookseller is their bookseller, and they come back over and over again, and they, they find books that they have in common with that person. So it's really that idea of independent bookstores building community with readers. Um, and it's a community around the written word. It's it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Michael, go ahead. I think maybe in the summer, uh, people are, are more prone to daydreaming, and they're looking for stories that will just send them into the dream. Um, they, they might be traveling. They might be going to the beach. They might be just taking a day off and enjoying themselves on their screened-in porch or on their deck. And they just want to daydream. So what they're looking for is really good stories, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, they're looking for something that takes them maybe out of themselves or connects them to a different world than they, than they know already. When people come in, Michael, in the summer, are they in general saying, help me out? Or are they saying, I heard about this awesome book. Please help me find it on the shelf. A, a lot of a lot of um, recommendations come through word of mouth, whether it's on social media or hearing about it on NPR or in a book club or through friends. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it is driven by... Um, you know, I, I heard about this book. Can you help me find it? And that's why, like like our other guests here today, um, you know, we have tables set up to display things that are you know in the media, on NPR, in the zeitgeist. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because if people want to see pictures of all the books that our booksellers brought in. It's a library in here today in The Exchange. We're also on Facebook Live, so you can check it out there. So, Liz, Bookery Manchester, first of all, are you even a year old yet? Maybe you haven't been through a summer season yet. We just celebrated a year last month, so we have celebrated a summer. This is our full, our second summer we're entering, and um, we're noticing two trends so far. People who are coming in looking for um, something easy to read but captivating, and then um, the reader who wants to, like, self-improvement, spend the summer reading something that will help them be a better person or figure out what they want to do in their life. That's interesting. And those are the trends that I definitely noticed looking at all the lists yesterday, you know, Publishers Weekly, Washington Post, and so forth. And Dan, there does seem to be maybe a few more of that um, genre of improve yourself, be a better person, not improve yourself like, you know, lose weight or stop smoking, but be a more sort of moral grounded person. Well, I think I think a lot of people, I have to interrupt myself. 
I just want to say how great it is that New Hampshire finally has a Main Street bookseller in Manchester. On it's been Elm a long Street. time coming. Long yeah, time. I used to have the Chamber of Commerce approach me all the time. I'm sure Michael did as well. And yep. it just for it to be a homegrown store, it's like great to have you on that in that space. We've Thanks, heard Liz. a lot of feedback from the community, and everyone is so excited that we're here too. So yeah. we couldn't be happier about it. And you're right on Elm Street, so it's not hard to find. Yeah, it really mm-hmm. fills in uh, a missing piece of the. Uh, the independent bookseller tribe in New Hampshire. Yeah, so it's fantastic that they're there because, I mean, they, they are, you know, native to Manchester. I mean, Dan or I could have gone in, but we would have been kind of carpetbaggers. Yeah. But, you know, it's just it's part of the national trend for independent bookstores. Our entire channel is growing. I mean, it's still not the royal road to wealth for anybody, independent bookselling. But, but our channel is growing and becoming more and more vigorous and important. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. That's okay. The, the no, question it's again was. Absolutely worth noting. <laughs> the question was. Books I seem to notice more this summer than in years past on sort of the, as Liz put it, be a better person um, books for the summer. I, Self-improvement. Yeah, I David I, Brooks has one, which is a follow-up to his other one. That's, that's on a lot of lists, that's for example. True. The David Brooks book, actually, is a book that I put on my list. He just spoke at the commencement at UNH in Durham, and um, we sold so many copies of, uh, of his book um, after that uh, commencement speech. The book is called The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life, and I, I love David Brooks, um, both for his writing as well as his commenting on uh, public television. Um, with Mark Shields uh, on the uh, news hour. Um, I do get frustrated with him at times, but I also really admire him. He's, uh, he's a very humane voice for traditional American values, um, and he translates them into um, uh, sort of uh, language that allows um, my generation, but also millennials and uh, – and, uh, and even younger, to kind of uh, connect with those traditional American values. He, he humanizes them in a way that isn't done very well. And I really admire him for his ability to do that. So yes, David Brooks is the second mountain, the quest for a moral life would definitely be a book like that. Um, yeah, what else, Michael, is on that sort of, again, be a more um, upstanding, grounded person. Well, one thing that swept, it's a little, it's a little off topic, but uh, one thing that swept uh, the book world a couple of months ago was uh, advice from Marie Kondo to get rid of all the books on your bookshelves yes, that don't morning. spark joy, quote right. unquote. And that became a very entertaining controversy in our little corner of the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, and Kondo, K-O-N-D-O, this yeah. is the decluttering guru. Right. I hear people quoting her all over the place. Absolutely. Does this plate bring you joy? No? Chuck it. Yeah, she's, she's definitely found ways to help people focus on what's important in their lives, but uh, the idea of getting rid of books was uh, sparked not joy, but a lot of controversy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and sometimes you find yourself, sorry, Marie Kondo, going back to those books that you exactly. thought you wouldn't reread. It might so. spark joy tomorrow, Marie, you never know. <laughs> I actually love to zig where she says to zag, I love to take the books that I love that spark joy in me, and I love to give them to people. Sure. Those are the ones I want to move on. That's, a, that's an acceptable yeah. solution. Yeah. So Liz, what's <laughs> one book that you can't wait to read this summer when you have some free time? Um, I started City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert, but haven't gotten around to finishing it, so I'm excited to finish that. Um, I know, I think it is on Michael's list. Yes. Yes. And Elizabeth Gilbert, she's of Eat, Pray, Love fame. So, right? Yes. So give us a little more on City of Girls, just a, a tantalizer there. Um, so it's about a young woman who goes to, I think it's New York City, yep. um, and lives with this cast of characters that are in, like, show business. Um, and she's just observing their crazy world and... Um, I haven't finished it, so don't know what happens, but I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, and I think it starts, right, where the woman is 95, and then she's remembering back to her time in the 1940s. That's right. In New York City, is yeah. that correct? Okay. That, that is right. She flunks out of Vassar at the age of something like 19, and because um, she didn't go to class, you know. Okay. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and she gets, as you say, with these, this, uh, you know, very eccentric cast of characters and gets swept up in a, in a different world that's much more sophisticated than the one she's used to. And it's, it reads first as a comedy, but it's really – underneath it, it's kind of a serious um, commentary in a way about race, class, and uh, you know, gay rights, um, you know, but also champagne and uh, satin and lace and things like that. Well, and again, um, since you mentioned Michael's list, Liz, I want to let listeners know, again, all the lists from Michael and Dan and Liz are on our website – their top picks for the summer in fiction 
and nonfiction. It's nhpr.org slash exchange. So those lists and any books that come up in our conversation today will be put there a little bit later. It takes us a little while to get it together, but it will be there for you at nhpr.org slash exchange. Dan Chartrand, how about you? What's one book you can't wait to read this summer? Well, City of Girls is the book that is selling in really? our store right now. Okay. Yes, Steph, um, our store manager, read it, and she describes it as a you know, this young woman is sent to New York City by her parents um, to live with her aunt. And uh, and she says, uh, so she goes a little wild. Okay, a lot wild. Mistakes are made. And then all caps, mistakes are made. <laughs> she has to live with the consequences. But what could have been tragedy has turned into a beautiful life. And then Steph says, ugh, that sounds cheesy. But just trust me, this is a great book. So that is kind of the book of the moment in the independent channel. Yeah. Um, what else, Michael, what, is on the top of your, your personal list? Well, it's funny because uh, yesterday at this time I would have said I really need to get around to Recursion by Blake Crouch. Um, and then last night when I was s- supposed to be studying up for this show, I opened Recursion by Blake Crouch. And at 2 in the morning I put it down having finished it. No, And I really? hadn't studied for wow. this show and I'm tired. <laughs> That's okay. We'll bring you some you coffee. Seem it's so a break. Perky. It's a, I, thank you, Dan. It's a it's a great page turner. Okay, that's a recommendation. It's um, you know, it's uh, it's it's science fiction. It's like if Philip K. Dick had a hip nephew who was working today. Um, you know, this is this is the book that he would write. Um, you know, it's all about uh, you know memory and whether you know. It, this this young inventor is trying to solve the problem of Alzheimer's and dementia, and she invents what's called a memory chair, which allows people to reconstruct and implant their own memories. And uh, but what happens is it's um, used for nefarious intent, and it creates all kinds of problems. And uh, the, the most of the book is a race against the clock to try to escape. Uh, pretty much the apocalypse. It's uh, wow. It's a. Uh, it's no, a. You up till two in the morning, right? I had to see whether it was going to be the apocalypse or not. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you. Technology <laughs> gone awry. We've never heard of that pretty before. Much. Go ahead, Liz. I read this also, and I'm not usually a mystery thriller or sci-fi person, but I really enjoyed it. Wow. Okay. Well, our listeners are also weighing in with their favorites, their picks for the summer. You can join us on Facebook. It's NHPR Exchange, or give us a call one eight hundred eight nine two. 6477. Email exchange at nhpr.org. A couple Facebook comments. Margaret says, for the rock and rollers out there, here are three memoirs that are totally enjoyable audiobooks. Margaret says, even the non rock and rollers might be surprised at how much they enjoy the quality of writing, narrative, and performance. Bruce Springsteen's Chrissy Hines and John Doe and Friends. That last one, she says, is called Under the Big Black Sun. And each writer reads their own chapter, so it is especially good as an audiobook. Margaret, thank you so much. Liz, what about audiobooks? A lot of us go on long car rides for summer vacation, and, you know, after a while, you need something to entertain your ears. That's actually how I read Recursion. I listened to the audiobook of it. Okay. Um, and I enjoyed it because it has multiple narrators, and it, it kind of keeps pace that way. Um, yeah. Is there another one that you recommend on audiobook, um, Liz? Um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't we'll throw it to Dan. Audiobook. The um, Elizabeth Gilbert book is an excellent audio book. Um, several of our staff have uh, listened to it. on The audio. one we just talked about. The City of Girls. City yeah, of Girls. By Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay. So, does she read it herself, Dan? I don't know that answer. Yeah, a lot of the time when people read their own books, I mean, it's kind of a crapshoot because you don't know if they're any good at reading them or not, but some of them are very good at it. Um, and actually, as... Um, yeah, I'm still always surprised when we sell these very, you know, sometimes they're expensive books on CD. Used to call them books on tape. Now they're books on CD. Uh, but so, you know, they run the gamut in price, and they're still it's still tremendously popular because people still want to listen to them in the car or wherever. And uh, there's also a new um, online version of the audiobooks um, called Libro FM that we're uh, promoting that's doing very well for the independent bookstores. Okay. Well, Margaret, thank you very much. Garrett in Londonderry says, I recently read and loved Say Nothing about the troubles in Northern Ireland and a decades-old unsolved murder, well-researched and beautifully written. So that's a recommendation from Garrett in Londonderry. Thank you, Garrett. Jane in Manchester says, I'd like to recommend a writer who studied under Charlie Simic at UNA and was also an NPR journalist. His name is Chris Foran. Uh, that's spelled F-O-R-H-A-N in case people are taking notes. And he wrote an extraordinary memoir of his early life and father. The book is called My Father Before Me, 
It deserves more praise than it's gotten. Jane, thank you for that recommendation. Again, we're taking your recommendations online on Facebook. You can send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. You can also give us a call at 1-800-892-6477. You know, since Jane mentioned um, an author, an uh, author who studied under Charlie Simic at UNH, New Hampshire authors are a specialty of local booksellers, so I'd love to hear what everybody has under authors from right here in the Granite State. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I think Charlie Sinek must be a great teacher because another student of his, Jennifer Militello, is uh, is a very good poet, and she's publishing a memoir called Knock Wood at the end of July, which uh, I, I think is going to be great. I just got an advanced copy of it. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Because you were up late Because I was reading other recursion. Book. <laughs> yes, exactly. And Charlie Simic, for people who don't know, is a very famous poet. Yes, yes, he sure is. He's great. Other New Hampshire authors that you've got going, Michael, in your store this summer? Um, there's a lot of... Um, you know, there's a lot of young adult books um, that are being written by New Hampshire authors. There's David Elliott, who lives in Warner. He's written a couple of novels for young adults in verse, which sounds crazy, but they really work and they're very popular. He wrote the story of the Minotaur in a book called Bull, and uh, he's written the story of Joan of Arc in a new, newer book called Voices. And wow. uh, yeah, these are these are really great books. And uh, there's a um, an author at St. Paul's School named Virginia McGregor who's just published a book called As Far as the Stars that uh, is very popular for young adults. Yeah, how about you, Dan? New Hampshire authors. So many. Um, we just hosted last week um, Jed Coffin, who teaches at UNH, and he's written a brilliant memoir called Rough House Friday about his time wrestling with his familial demons. He went to southeast Alaska. He actually became part of a uh, Friday night boxing club, amateur boxing club in southeast Alaska, thus the Rough House Friday. And he's kind of wrestling with his family demons as he's climbing the ladder of this amateur boxing uh, society in wow, Alaska. Wow, so wrestling with physical, in terms of the physical sense and mental sense. It's a, it's a beautiful memoir. And Jed uh, teaches in the English department at uh, UNH and lives in South Berwick, Maine. That's great. Um, speaking of YA, we have a local author, Lisa Bunker, who's also a rep in the house in uh, Concord. She represents us in the house. She's one of four reps from Exeter. She has a new book out called Zenobia July, and it's uh, the story of a young woman who um, is trans but identifies as a woman, and she's going through high school. Brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, Lisa's very important both on the political scene and on New Hampshire's literary scene. And finally, um, there's a woman who lives in Dover named Linnea Hartsicker, and she has basically taken the um, the old Icelandic Viking uh, sagas and she's made them into novels. She's kind of naturalized them so they're not so stilted. And these are brilliant uh, books about the Viking life in uh, the late uh, – late uh, 900s. Um, oh, that's so it's brilliant historical novels by a woman who moved to Dover from uh, Massachusetts and a uh, great writer. And the third book in the trilogy is coming out this fall. And the first two books are The Half-Drowned King and uh, The Sea Queen. Okay. And again, all these books will be on our website later today. We'll get the books that are mentioned during the hour like the people who just contacted us on Facebook. We'll also get any book mentioned by our guests and their lists of top reads for summer 2019. And Liz, after a break, I'll get your uh, New Hampshire authors as well. And we'll keep taking your questions and comments. Stay with us. This is The Exchange on NHPR. NHPR, good morning. NHPR's fiscal year is coming to a close at the end of the month, and thanks to all of our members who have shown their support with a gift. While we continue to plan for the news we know is coming and to prepare for the breaking news we can't predict, we still need your help to meet our year-end goals. So please, if you haven't done so already, make your donation at nhpr.org, and thank you. 
Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from Edvest in You, a local New Hampshire nonprofit specializing in college student loans and student refinancing options. Information online at nhstudentloans.org. And from Grapponi Automotive Group, equipping buyers with new and used vehicles 100% online, including home delivery. Grapponi.com starts and completes the entire process. Turning partly sunny for today, slight chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms in northern parts of the state. Highs today upper 70s to lower 80s. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Canoy. Today, it's our annual summer book show. Tell us what's on your reading list, or if you need some advice, our guests are here with their picks. Also, any book mentioned on the show will be on our website later today, nhpr.org slash exchange. So check it out later on. You can give us a call right now. It's 1-800-892-6477. You can send us an email, exchange at nhpr.org. Use Facebook or Twitter at NHPR Exchange. And we're also on Facebook Live today. Our guests are Dan Chartrand, owner of Water Street Bookstore in Exeter, Michael Herman, owner of Gibson's Bookstore in Concord, and Liz Cipriano, general manager of Bookery Manchester. And Liz, just before the breaks, uh, we were talking about New Hampshire authors, so I'd love to know what's popular among authors from the good old Granite State in your store. We have an exciting local author um, partnership coming up. We're doing One Book, One Manchester this year for Gloria Norris's Cuckoo Land. It's a memoir of her growing up in the 70s on the west side of Manchester. Oh, wow. Um, dealing with uh, opioid problems, um, abuse, and all that. So she is, I think she's coming to Manchester to speak in September. So we're really excited about that to have her back. And just remind listeners what those programs are all about. They're pretty well established in Concord and a couple other cities, but go ahead. They are. It's where a city or a town selects a title to read together as a community, talk about it, discuss it. Usually it has some topics in there that are worth discussing on a broader scale um, with different opinions and, and backgrounds. Does Exeter have a one book? Program in? I know Concord do. does. Yeah, often these programs are done in conjunction with the local independent bookstore and the local library system. So uh, we work very closely with Exeter Public Library to do kind of a, a book that we've done nonfiction books that have an issue that we want to work on as a community. Um, I love the idea of taking a memoir like uh, Liz's store has done and uh, coming at the issue a little more indirectly. So I'm making notes right now. With someone from Manchester. So that's really interesting. That, um, that's a great book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, have you read it? I have. That was one of the, actually, I stayed up all night reading that before one of these shows too, a couple <laughs> of years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I sense a fantastic. trend, Michael. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, and I think one year, um, Concord's program did, right, Michael? The Last Policeman, which yes. was written. Ben Winters. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It takes place in Concord. It takes place in Concord and he has family here. Um, yeah. So it was great for local detail, local color. Yeah, and that got national play. I mean, I heard that everywhere. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's great. And um, good luck with that program. I Thanks. hope that works out. Our listeners are jumping in again with their questions and comments and favorites for summer reading. 1-800-892-6477 is the number for you to call. 1-800-892-6477. Send us an email, exchange at NHPR. Org. Once again, exchange at nhpr.org. And let's go to Julie in Exeter, your hometown, Dan. Go ahead, Julie. You're on the air. Welcome. Thanks for calling in. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. I just uh, wanted to do a plug for a local author from Brentwood um, who I saw speak at Water Street Books several years ago. Um, he is um, He wrote a book called Old Man on a Bicycle, which I think is a great summer read, but also especially good for cyclists. Um, he recounts his uh, bike ride across the U.S. at the age of 72 and um, the way that aging affects um, exercise. Uh, and his name is Donald Pedersen. Um, and uh, I just think that's a really great book to read, um, but also a quick read for the summer. Wow. Sounds great. Thank you, Julie for the recommendation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Dan, since yeah. uh, he was at your store? Don's an amazing man. He was actually a diplomat in uh, the Horn of Africa. Wow. And then uh, he and his wife and his family re uh, resettled to the seacoast. He served in the house as well. He was a, a representative from Brentwood. But he took this uh, country cr cross-country bicycle ride at the age of 72, as Julie said, and uh, 
And he wrote a, a, a wonderful self-published memoir about that journey. All right. Well, more recommendations from our listeners. Eileen sent us a note. Love this program. Just rediscovered the book Forever by Pete Hamill. His writing is always beautifully written, lyrical, with a mixture of the magical and historically accurate. Eileen says this book has has it all. And even though I had read it before, I couldn't put it down. It's the kind of book that I was sad to finish. Eileen, I know how that feels. You know, since she mentioned historically accurate, you guys know, and Liz, just to let you know, I'm a huge fan of historical fiction. That's my favorite genre. And I wonder if anybody wants to jump in with any historical fiction that they have at their stores, and and I'll come by it, promise. (laughs) Michael? um, There's a new book uh, called uh, The Guest Book by Sarah Blake. It's uh, it's an intergenerational novel about uh, race and privilege and wealth and the loss of wealth. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's one of those books where – so it covers several generations, and you can tell from the first page you're in the hands of an excellent writer. You know know that feeling? Yes. We just say, oh, oh, good. You know, it's like – this book won't let me down, you know, and it and it doesn't. So that's that's a great um, historical Give us the name novel. Again, please, Michael. Uh, the guest, uh, the guest book by okay. Sarah Blake. Okay, and other fiction that you love, Liz, historical or not? I have two historical fiction picks on my list: um, Cape May by Chip Creek. That's on a lot of lists this summer. Yeah, yes. it's really good read. Um, a young couple in the 1950s, young newlywed, goes to honeymoon off season um, in Long Island, and they meet some loud and lavish friends that end up changing it has repercussions on their marriage that they just never expected to have wow. um, so it's a really good interesting read historical fiction and that's Cape May again yes. and I think that's on two of you folks lists that's on the bookeries list and um, I think on somebody else's Isn't list that? on uh, yeah on your Sometimes, list yeah. yeah we share that title with the bookery we also share a title that just released on Tuesday called uh, Evie Drake starts over it's another book that's set in Maine like the uh, like the guest, the guest book, book yep. um, sort of uh, this woman, Evie, uh, rarely leaves her house. Everyone assumes it's about uh, her mourning the death of her husband, but that's not really the story. But she's keeping her story to herself like a good New Englander and a good Mainer. And then this guy who's got the yips, this baseball player, he oh, can't throw yips. straight. Yeah. yeah, which is a thing. Yeah. Baseball <laughs> players lose the ability to throw straight. They kind of gets in their head. Yeah, Chuck Knobloch well, was... Uh, yeah, yeah, Chuck Knobloch. Yeah. Uh, there was another... Uh, uh, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Anyway, that happens. This guy, this baseball player, comes north, rents a room from Evie in her house, and they connect in a way that's totally unexpected, the professional baseball player and this shut-in widow. And it's just a, a wonderful book that no one has read yet because it just released yesterday. <laughs> Um, so that's a great summer read. Evie Drake starts starts over by Linda Holmes. Other fiction you want to mention, Liz? Um, one book I really enjoyed, The Saturday Night Ghost Club by Craig Davidson. Um, it comes out in July, so it's not quite out yet. But it's so heartwarming. It's a coming-of-age story, a young boy. Um, I think he's 12. And he it taps into nostalgia. It takes place in the 80s around um, Niagara Falls. And it's just, it's such a comfortable read. Um, it just brings you back to childhood and what it's like growing up and believing in ghost stories and just having those nights where you're riding your bike down the street with all your friends. And I, I just loved it. Oh, that sounds great. All right, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, well, speaking of um, historical fiction, uh, here's one that's been on the bestseller list for almost a year. And I can't believe people, it's still at the top of the list. I can't believe people are still discovering it, but they are. So if you're listening and you haven't read where the crawdads sing, go out and get it. Um, it's by a woman who was formerly just known as a as a, an award winning nature writer, and uh, and she took her, you know she tried her hand at fiction and wrote an instant bestseller that was promoted by Reese Witherspoon and has been at the top of the list forever. It's set in uh, coastal North Carolina, and a young woman who basically lives on her own, kind of wild out in the marshes, is accused of murdering um, the local uh, Lothario and. Um, and you know, and it's in the middle of a, a murder mystery, and and all of that. It's uh, it's it's a great evocation of of the natural world in this really desolate landscape in North Carolina that I really enjoyed. Right. And it's set in the fifties and sixties. Let's take another call. This is Reeve in Wolfboro. Hi, Reeve. You're on the exchange. Welcome. Go ahead. Hi. I have two books to recommend, and I will talk really fast because I want so many other books recommended. <laughs> <laughs> 
the uh, they're both nonfiction. The first one I'm going to recommend is um, on the universal basic income. It's by Andrew Yang. The title is "The War on Normal People," and Yang is running for president. I think he sounds great, but I had nothing, no idea that people from Milton Friedman to Thomas Paine have been recommending a universal basic income. And in this book, Yang makes the recommendation that everybody, that we're more in need of this than ever before. So I found that incredibly informative. Um, the second book is called Charged by, C-H-A-R-G-E-D, Charged by Emily Bazelon. And I had no idea until I read this book how horrifyingly um, powerful prosecutors, district attorneys are. And we have the power to help change the prison system more than I knew. Each individual by discovering what their own prosecutors in their hometowns believe and voting differently. So, Reeve, so. you're in the mood for political books this summer, it sounds like. <laughs> I suppose we have to be and enjoy it here in New Hampshire. <laughs> well, I really appreciate the call because we should talk about this. It is a big, big political year in New Hampshire with the primary heating up. So, Michael, if every presidential candidate on the Democratic side wrote a book, you could fill a whole shelf because um, there's a lot of candidates. Of, a lot but, of them have. But what about those? Uh, yeah. Kamala Harris has a, a memoir. Um, Mayor Poot, Pete Buttigieg, sorry for mangling the name there, um, has a book that's been on the bestseller list for a while. And you've been um, hosting a lot of these candidates at your we've, store. We've had them come through, yeah, as um, as other bookstores have, um, you know, because they, they like – coming to public spaces and being surrounded by books, um, you know, elevates the tone. <laughs> <laughs> Good backdrop for them. Yeah. Liz, political books, are you guys into selling these or are you leaving them, we leaving are. that up to someone yeah, else? Yeah, just like Michael, yeah. we've had um, a lot of candidates come through our stores. Well, um, Marianne Williamson, um, Andrew Yang was here mm -hmm. last fall. Um, so we've had a lot of them as well. Dan? Yeah, we've hosted um, Senator uh, Booker. Uh, we've also hosted Marianne Williamson and... Uh, I think uh, Kristen Gillibrand stopped by briefly uh, one Saturday morning uh, just to kind of <laughs> check out who was buying books, um, <laughs> which was great. It's it's a wonderful part of the landscape of New Hampshire, sure and independent bookstores privileged. are definitely kind of in sync with what's happening uh, on the political scene. It's There's a long tradition. All right. Well, Reeve, thank you very much for bringing that up because that is something that we should talk about. Here's an email from Stephen in Dover. And I'm going to throw this to everybody. Stephen says, my wife prefers fiction and I prefer nonfiction. With that in mind, any suggestions on a book we can read together? Ooh. Stephen, awesome question. Great question. I'm going to stump the panel here. I have uh, it. Dan, oh, Dan's got it. Okay. And it's it's yeah, also on, Mike, else jump into. It's on Michael's list. I was reaching for it too. The two of you need to form a little book club <laughs> and you need to read the new book, Furious Hours Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Sepp. Furious gonna, Hours. Yep. Furious Hours, and now I'm going to flip it over to Michael to tell you what it's about. Well, it's about uh, the uh, – it's it's a mystery concerning Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird and never wrote another book. And there were rumors flying around for decades that she was working on a book. It was about to be published. It was in her drawer. It was in a vault. It wasn't written yet. It was written. Um, it's coming. It's not coming. It was about uh, – apparently she was working for decades on a story uh, about a, a serial killer in the South um, who was then murdered in front of like hundreds of people at a funeral and who then uh, – and whose own murderer was uh, declared innocent <laughs> despite hundreds of eyewitnesses. Wow. How and, have I not heard of this? Well, you got to read Furious Hours. It's a great, great story. And it's all about you know her life after To Kill a Mockingbird, just where she was and you know, what she was doing in New York, her friendship with Truman Capote. Uh, here's one thing about the book that I really didn't understand until I read it. I mean all these years – People, people have been floating the idea that Truman Capote really helped her with To Kill a Mockingbird because she had never written another book. And here he is, a famous writer, her best friend from childhood. Whereas in reality, it was the other way around. She helped him with In Cold Blood. She traveled to Kansas with him and interviewed all these people who never in a million years would have talked to a guy like Truman Capote in Kansas in like 1964 or 5. Uh, but they would talk to somebody like Harper Lee, who was very prim and proper. 
Um, you know, and so she really shaped in cold blood. So I, that's that's just part of it. It's, it's a, a lot of wonderful stories all rolled up into one book. Wow. Yeah. There you have it. Yeah, it's great. One for the fiction and the nonfiction. Yeah, we think so. People we do. in your life. <laughs> Liz, you've got a, a nonfiction book um, on your list that was on a lot of the lists that I looked at, too. Save me the plums. So could that maybe satisfy the the fiction and the nonfiction couple that we just heard from? It might. I think it's on Michael's list as well. Yeah. Um, I've been on a huge kick uh, reading about the the food industry and and restaurants, and it just fascinates me. It's its own world in itself. Um, so after I read Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain and Sweet Bitter, um, I think this just fell right in that category. Um, it's about Ruth Rachel and becoming the editor-in-chief of Gourmet Magazine and, and it, you know, it's it how it changed under her control, but then ultimately with the age of the internet, um, how it just ended. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And we have a lot of listeners who are would classify themselves as foodies, so they might really enjoy that. And Anthony Bourdain also, you know, tragically... Um, Died last year. This year, mm-hmm. people celebrated or observed um, Anthony Bourdain, Bourdain Day. I had a friend who got together with some other friends and made a bunch of his food. So I'm guessing his books are his books selling really, well. They did, unfortunately. You know, I mean, they spiked. Um, you know, after after he passed away, and uh, they continue to sell very well. It was such a tragedy that he passed away so so young. Uh, yeah, uh, Ruth Reichel's book is on my list. I I read it. it you can read it in a couple of days. It's it's uh, it's really well written, but it moves really fast. And um, you know, she she took basically a magazine that had become stuffy. It wasn't the, the the great magazine she remembered from when she was a child, and she turned it into sort of a cutting edge magazine that was yet you know a glossy magazine published by Condé Nast. So there was a real um, you know it was really very interesting. She published uh, David Foster Wallace's famous essay, "Consider the Lobster," which was very controversial at the time. Um, and, uh, people, she, I, I read an interview with her a couple of days ago where, uh, she said that people are still mad about what she did to Gourmet. Like 20 years later, they wrote the book, they read the book and, and they were writing in, you know, that, you know, they're putting comments on, uh, on websites about, uh, you know, how she, how she, you know, drove Gourmet into the ground, which wasn't what happened. I mean, advertising you know, dried up after the recession hit sure, in 2008. Sure, upheaval in the publishing it industry terrible. in general. Yeah, it was terrible, and Especially yeah. for cooking magazines where a lot of people look up their recipes online and so but she, forth. But she's a great writer. She's a great food writer and she's a great memoirist. Yeah. All right. Well, Stephen, there you go. I hope that satisfies and that you and your wife, as somebody said, can form a, a little book club of two and find fiction and nonfiction that satisfies. Sheila from Concord writes, I recommend The Leavers by Lisa Ko. That's spelled K-O. Um, an award-winning novel with a different take on the experience of an undocumented worker and her American-born child. Thank you, Sheila. Linda on Facebook says, if you grew up with Harry Potter, don't miss Sarah Gailey's Magic for Liars, a great read that turns the magical boarding school trope on its head. It's noir vibe and clever, snappy, and surprisingly introspective writing sweep you into a twisty mystery with a satisfying conclusion. Very highly recommended. Linda, that sounds great. I have to pick that up for the uh, the young adult readers in my household. So thank you, Linda. Jennifer from Piermont says, To Have and to Hold, Motherhood, Marriage, and the Modern Dilemma by Bo- Molly Millwood. Jennifer says, A must read for any mom, new or old. So Jennifer, thank you for that one. I want to remind everybody that all the books mentioned by our listeners, by our guests, will be on our website a little bit later today nhpr.org slash exchange. So coming up, I'm going to ask all of you about young adult, what you've got there, kids books, people always want their kids to read over the summer. And there's a couple more books that I want to definitely ask all of you about, including a baseball book um, that you have, Michael. All that's coming up. Stay with us. This is The Exchange on New Hampshire Public Radio.
Google is getting into the housing market. It's investing in affordable housing around the San Francisco Bay Area. Stanford University also plans to spend billions on housing. Local governments across the country are struggling to save residents from getting priced out. What should be done about the housing crisis? And what does affordable even mean these days? Next time on 1A. That's coming up at 10 o'clock here on NHPR. Support for NHPR comes from you, our listeners, and from New England College, offering art classes and workshops for the community at its new Manchester location, the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Information at nhia.edu slash ce. And from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, proud supporter of Crossroad, NHPR's New Hampshire's opioid reporting project, nhcf.org. This is NHPR. This is The Exchange. I'm Laura Canoy. Today, what to read this summer. We're hearing our guests' recommendations and those of our listeners. It's our summer book show, the 2019 edition. As always, any book mentioned on the show will be on our website later today, nhpr.org slash exchange, as well as the picks from our guests. They're top books for summer 2019 in fiction and nonfiction. We're talking with Liz Cipriano, general manager of Bookery Manchester, Michael Herman, owner of Gibson's Bookstore in Concord, and Dan Chartrand, owner of Water Street Bookstore in Exeter. And we've mentioned a couple young adult titles already this hour, but Dan, I wonder if you have anything else that you want to make sure gets out there. Yeah, I have a great crossover book. Um, The author, Ted Chang, who wrote a collection of stories called The Stories of Your Life and Others, which was one of those stories was the basis for the Academy Award-nominated film Arrival, which was this amazing film. I actually saw the film before I read the story, and then I read that story, and then I read all the stories in that collection. He has a new book. It's called Exhalation. It's Stories by Ted Chang, C-H-I-A-N-G. And this book is just amazing. I've read it, but Alice, who um, works in my store, is the main um, evangelist for this book. And she just says, I've once heard modern art described as something you often say, I could have done that. But crucially, you didn't. I feel like I could have written any of Chang's stories, but I didn't. Perhaps that's for the best because Chang is an extremely thorough person. He takes these concepts that are kind of sci-fi concepts, but then he naturalizes them and makes them full of wonder at the same time. It's a perfect book for a younger or an older young adult person. It's what we call a, a kind of an adult young adult crossover. So I can't recommend highly enough Exhalation Stories by Ted Chang for an older young adult reader. Anything else in the kids category or young adult category, Liz? For kids, one of my favorite books, uh, it's new in paperback this year. It's called Pax by Sarah Penny Packer. It's about a young boy who raises a baby fox, and at some point he has to let him go back in the woods. And um, it's just the the bond that these the, this boy and animal has, similar to a pet dog, um, and his his struggle to get back to the fox and find him and um, it's just so it's it's really sweet. Is it a book for younger kids with pictures? It is. And I would so say forth? middle grade, yeah. like eight to twelve. Okay, years old. All right, let's go back to our listeners. And Amy's calling in from Enfield. Hi, Amy. You're on the air. Thanks for being with us. Hi. Thanks for having me. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, really quickly, the listener who was looking for a book that he and his wife would both enjoy. He likes nonfiction, and she likes fiction. Um, that's my husband and I, uh, and we really like to read Malcolm Gladwell books, um, really any of them, like Outliers. Uh, it's pop science, basically, so there's a, it is nonfiction, but he writes in a way where it's very, it really captures your interest, and it's story-based, really. Um, so I recommend any Malcolm Gladwell book for that couple. Um, but I wanted to also recommend a book, I don't think it's very well known, I don't know the author I don't know that the author is really well known. The author is Roman Blair, and the book is The Island of Echoes. It's actually free on Kindle Unlimited. I just sort of stumbled across it, and it is fiction, and it's sort of historical fiction slash sci-fi, but it really surprised me in how much it resonates with sort of the social climate today, Um, people talking about sort of change for the better and, um, you know, accepting people for who they are. 
And um, Well, Amy, thank you. And I'm glad um, that she mentioned Malcolm Gladwell's books because I don't think he has a big one this year. But, Dan, he's often been a big seller here in New Hampshire. And, yeah, and Michael, go ahead. One. He has a new one coming out. He does. Okay. I, I'm trying. I was just getting on my phone to try to figure <laughs> out the title. It's, it's about how people don't understand each other. They talk past each other. And there's some neuroscience and social science behind all that. And it's very timely. It's Uh coming out this fall. Okay. Amy, thank you so much. Patrick says, in our present political setting, I would recommend The Stony Road by Lewis Henry Bates Jr., a look back at the ugliness of racism still with us. Patrick, thank you. Linda on Facebook says, oh, I already read that one. That's, uh, if you grew up with Harry Potter, you'll love Sarah Gailey. Linda, thank you again for that one. Go ahead. The Stony Road's a a great book of history about reconstruction by the Harvard professor Skip Gates. Um, Brilliant book, and it was a tie-in to a public television um, documentary. Um, There's so much history uh, that comes out right at this time of year because of Father's Day and graduation. Rick Atkinson's first first volume in the trilogy about the American Revolution is out, The British Are Coming, and it covers uh, 1775 to 1777. There will be two more after this, and Rick is the one. He's a great military historian who just – a few years ago, finished a trilogy about the U.S. Army and the European theater in World War II. Equally wonderful. Wow. Go ahead, Michael. Speaking of history um, and speaking of people who, who passed away and left us too young, um, Tony Horwitz uh, just published a new book, and he just died uh, at the end of May. Uh, it's a new book called Spying on the South, an Odyssey Across the American South. And the American Divide. And what he's doing is he's following in the footsteps of Frederick Law Olmsted, who's known primarily today as the designer of Central Park in Manhattan, but who was known mostly in the 19th century as a journalist who was who went undercover and wrote about, you know, what what was going on in the South in like the 1850s, right before the Civil War. And so Tony Horowitz followed in his footsteps and, and has written a great it's – a, it's a work of history. It's a memoir. It's a travelogue. And it's an examination of the issues that have continued to plague us since the Civil War. Wow. And he wrote Confederates in the Attic 20 years ago, which was about, you know, how we never really resolved those issues in the way that, you know, say Germany or South Africa had, you know, sort of came to a truth and reconciliation moment where – you know, where they, they healed their countries. And we, we've we never done it. And Tony Horowitz's last book is getting to the bottom of that, following in the footsteps of, of his famous predecessor. Give us the title again, Michael, in case it, Stephen is listening, because that sounds also good for the nonfiction and the fiction it, it's crowd. It's called Spying on the South, an Odyssey Across the American Divide. Okay. Well, hefty topics um, also for the summer. So it isn't all just escapist speech reading, although... Personally, that's what I like to do in the summer, but clearly other people have other ideas for the summer, and that's fantastic. Um, Sarah says, with all the current abortion debates right now, it's incredibly interesting to learn how Planned Parenthood got started. Terrible Virtue by Ellen Feldman is fascinating. Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood's founder, was one of 11 children in an Irish Catholic family who watched her mother die because of her many pregnancies. There's actually a lot of sex in the book, Sarah says. FYI, quick read and so interesting. Sarah, thank you so much. Emily says, I can't recommend enough Ivan Doig's book, The Last Bus to Wisdom, the story of a young boy who lives with his grandmother who is sent by bus to live with an aunt or cousin he's never met in Wisconsin. The writing is great. The storyline is wonderful. And it's a feel-good book. Emily, thank you very much for that. So weighty topics. What do you have that's fun, Liz? (laughs) Um, I could not stop laughing about this um, book, Hollow Kingdom by Kira Jane Buxton. It's narrated by a domesticated pet crow. um, And he... A domesticated (laughs) pet crow. They don't seem like brilliant pets. They seem very independent. Exactly. So everything he's ever learned about the world, he's learned from watching TV. And all of a sudden there's this apocalypse and his his human cannot take care of him anymore. So he and his and his friend dog, Dennis, they bust out of the house and, and try to figure out what's going on in the world. And it's just so funny. It's I couldn't stop laughing. That sounds great. Give us the name again. That sounds great. What is it? (laughs) (laughs) Hollow Kingdom by Kira Jane Buxton. Michael can stay up till 2 in the morning reading that one. Never again, Laura. Never again. (laughs) No, it's great. It's a measure of how engaging a book is that you stay up until 2 in the morning reading it. Michael, you've got uh, a hefty tome right in front of you. Tell us what that is. 
Oh, you're talking about this one? The Mueller Report. Oh, well, you know. Bright red cover. I debated whether to put it on, on the list or not because we didn't want to be political. But honestly, it is the best thriller of the year. And um, and it's going to be back in the news because Mueller's going to be testifying in front of Congress uh, next month. And so it's it really it's it's a fascinating read. No matter where you fall on the on the political divide, um, you know it's uh, it's got drama, it's got strange characters, it's got intrigue, and it's got a lot of redactions. <laughs> you know, it's but it's it's just it's just a, a fascinating read. There's a couple of good editions out. One from Melville House, which is the one I have here, and one that was put together by the Washington Post with commentary from from their writers. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I didn't want to do political books, but I couldn't think of a better thriller. Well, that's interesting. So publishing, a publishing house at least, felt like enough people would just want to read this thing in paper form, reading not look PDF, at it online. Reading a 400-page yeah. PDF yeah. online is not easy. Sure. So you pull it out yeah. when you've got time and so yeah. forth. Interesting. Yeah. It's a fat one, but yeah. in paperback, so it's not too heavy. Go ahead, Dan. Three different publishers actually published yeah, Sky them okay. as well. Yeah. Three different editions. That is correct. Um, I'm going to switch to David McCullough's book, The Pioneers, because someone mentioned Wisconsin, and uh, Wisconsin an was in the old historian. Northwest Territory. Yeah. David McCullough has written this great book called The Pioneers, the heroic story of the settlers who brought the American ideal west. The original west was the Northwest Territory, which was the territory north and west of the Ohio River. So that included those incredible states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio, which is kind of the pivot point for our politics right now, if you think about it. And what McCullough does is he, he talks about the, the New England, what would now be congregational ministers, so the descendants of the Puritan, the Congregationalists, how they were really the, um, the, the pioneers that insisted the Northwest Territory be opened up to the public and settled, not given to one sort of individual or corporations. And it's just this amazing, fine-grained, detailed story of how the Northwest Territory was settled. So right. David McCullough is our historian of David the David McCullough never, never disappoints. It's true. Susan sent us a recommendation. She says, I am three-quarters of the way through The Flight Attendant by another favorite New England author, Chris Bohalian. It's great fiction, woman with a drinking problem and poor judgment, but basically a good person, caught up in a murder, international intrigue with modern geopolitical issues. Wow. Susan. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. That sounds great. And again, Chris Bohalian is often on the top of um, the lists for local booksellers. Denise says, I'm the children's librarian at Rye Elementary. If you long for a charming children's chapter book for grades three and up with a magical air and a profound, sad, but hope-filled ending, Wicked Nix, and that's N-I-X, by Lena Coakley will enchant you and warm your heart. Denise, thank you very much. It's great to hear from a children's librarian. Casey suggests Witches, that's spelled with a Y, not an I. Witches by Scott Snyder is a graphic novel that takes place in the woods of Litchfield, New Hampshire. It is so good for those into graphic novel horror stories. Cassie, thank you very much for that recommendation. We haven't talked about graphic novels. How well are those selling at your stores? Liz? We are seeing uh, a boost in those sales, of course, um, especially for middle grade. I feel like it's a good entry for kids who don't really want to tackle a huge book. Um, They can still get their reading in, but it's a little easier and lighter. For reluctant readers, so to speak. It can bring up... Um, bigger subjects in an easier to digest format too. And I read something just this morning. Um, someone wrote, "If you're afraid that graphic novels is quote unquote lazy reading, fear not." Some evidence that connecting the pictures with the words, you know, engages the brain in a different way. I know you're a fan of graphic novels, Dan. Yeah, I, I was turned on to graphic novels back in the late '90s by a librarian who said that um, graphic novels and comic books are the gateway drug to reading. Yeah, and yeah, that that they, says they it are. all. Yeah, yeah, they are they are really good. I mean, I I read them. I don't read them heavily, but um, you know, we have an event uh, with uh, Marek Bennett, uh, a graphic novelist who's written about the Civil War uh, tonight, actually. And uh, you know, it's you're able to cover you know important topics um, in a format that uh, that younger readers can can handle. All right, well, keep those recommendations coming. Again, any book that we discuss during the hour that comes up will be on our website later today, nhpr.org slash exchange. You can send in your recommendations on Facebook, and we're on Facebook Live today as well. Or send us an email, exchange at nhpr. 
dot org. Sarah in Concord, while we're talking about younger readers, Sarah in Concord says, my 10-year-old daughter and I just read The War That Saved My Life and The War I Finally Run, uh, Won excuse me, by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley about World War II. They were sad, happy, fabulous, and informative. Highly recommend. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, you know, we only have a couple minutes left. Is there any other book, Liz, that you feel, as Sarah says, you would highly recommend? Well, I would read anything written by Matt Haig. Um, How to Stop Time is new out in paperback as of, I think, last week or two weeks ago. Um, he, The first book I read of his, The Humans, was in 2013, and I just love his writing style. I mean, right on the cover of the paperback, How to Stop Time, Kristen Hanna says, a great summer read. So this is a great paperback, stick in your be- beach bag. Um, it's about a man who doesn't necessarily time travel but he just ages very slowly um and he falls in love with a woman um so that's his version of being stuck in this time warp where he really shouldn't be committed to someone because he just will outlive them by decades so that's really interesting because there's so much in time travel i don't want to say it's overused because that's not for me to say but there's a lot of novels where people time travel um and that's fine, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Dan, how about you? Anything else that you absolutely want to make sure people know about? So many good books to choose from, but I'm going to choose. And if you want to see a picture, by the way, we'll have them later <laughs> on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and so forth. I'm going to choose a memoir called Rough Magic, Riding the World's Loneliest Horse Race. It's by Laura Pryor Palmer. And Rough Magic is uh, the story of this woman who decides to compete in the Mongol Derby, which is an infamously difficult and long horse race across a thousand kilometers of Mongolian wilderness, and she wins. Um, so it's just this uh, great sort of you're at an impasse in your life and you decide to do something daring and incredible. This has been a real indie bookstore uh, favorite this spring since it's been published. Again, Rough Magic by Laura Pryor Palmer. How about you, Michael? Well, I'm going to put aside my own choices, and I'm going to recommend some books that my booksellers would kill me if I didn't mention (laughs) because I made them write me some emails. Um, Ryan recommends Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik, and she says, this is one of those books that would be perfect to read on a super hot day because it's set in such a frigid, icy landscape. The words themselves will cool you down. It's a twist on the Rumpelstiltskin tale with vicious fairies and delectable magic, and the descriptions will send shivers down your spine. And Kelso from the bookstore recommends On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, which I think is on Dan's list. That's on a couple Um, lists. It's on a lot of lists. Um, You know, it's a beautifully written, it's a a novel by by a poet and it shows a beautifully written novel. So... Any books you're looking forward to in the fall? I always ask you guys this at the end of the summer book show. It feels a little unfair because there's so much still on the table for summer reading. But Liz, something that you're just, you can't wait for in the fall? Uh, Michael actually just pulled it out. The uh, Anne Duan Patcha is coming in September, I think. And I'm so excited for that. And they are having an event at Gibson's um, with her. Not that there isn't enough to read for the summer that you could last you until next summer. But yeah. How about you, Dan? Um, Ann Patchett's one of our independent bookselling crowd. She also owns a store uh, in Nashville. So that's an important book. And we did mention the Malcolm Gladwell that's coming out this fall. Sure. And I think there's an event uh, that NHPR is connected with uh, for right. Gladwell in Portsmouth this fall. Great. Yeah, here's uh, a book that's coming out from Rick Russo in August. Chances are it's a novel about uh, three guys who get together and try to figure out what happened to a young woman they knew when they were younger. And here's a book that's not coming out till January, but it's 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 a real buzz book now called American Dirt by Janine Cummins, and um, it's the new girl with the dragon tattoo set in the narco world in Mexico. Okay. So. Lots to look forward to, lots to read. Check out the website later today, nhpr.org slash exchange for all the books that were mentioned this hour and our guests' picks. Happy summer. I hope the weather is... Um, improves and uh, we have a real summer great for summer reading thank you all for being here thank you you. this is the exchange on nhpr the views expressed in this program are those of the individuals and not those of nhpr its board of trustees or its underwriters if you missed part of today's program listen to the exchange anytime at nhpr.org or Subscribe to our podcast. Search Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher for NHPR Exchange. This is NHPR.